and the noise that was coming from that creature is what well, was on the recorder here. took that recording, we sent it into the lab to have it analyzed, and it came back that there's no metallic noises in the recording indicating that it wasn't made by some kind of a machine. And they said there's no voice, uh, no human has vocal cords enough to throw the high pitches and the low pitches at the same time that was coming from then. But it was Bob Gimlin and his friend Roger Patterson out trekking at Bluff Creek in Northern California who were the ones to suddenly find a large hairy creature appear in front of them when they actually had a loaded cine camera with them. We came around a bend in the creek and there stood a big hairy human-like creature. It appeared to be between six and seven feet tall. The creature looked at us for a few seconds turned and walked slowly away and uh, it was kind of in a loamy type soil left good footprints it walked directly away from us at a, just a slow stroll just like a man would be walking away from something downtown it never did break into a run well the animal appeared to be a female due to the fact that it appeared to uh, have mammary glands and the thing walked very agile, very fluently, and it had huge bulky muscles. An overall description, it looked like a huge hairy human being. Well, English and Russian scientists have analyzed this film very carefully and they've concluded that the stride is quite unhuman and be very difficult for a man to imitate. However, I think we showed in the beginning of 2001 that skilled mimes can make completely convincing ape men. So this is not proven. But the Patterson film did have backup evidence, which is now in the hands of Dr. Grover Krantz. By far the most convincing evidence is the, uh, the plaster casts that I've got here of the uh, footprints. I'll show you some of them here. For instance, here is a track that was uh, cast right after Roger Patterson made his movie in Northern California. The imprint of the foot not only pressed into the ground, but also in pushing off, it raised a mound of dirt in the middle of the uh, footprint. And this indicates that it was a flexible foot and a rigid fake could not have made this. That's not as convincing as this other track. This is a 17 inch track that was picked up in northeastern Washington state. And this is what was evidently a crippled individual because here we have two tracks of the same individual you're looking at the bottom of the feet, and this right foot is crippled. <clears throat> it is distorted lengthwise, bent, missing one toe, and most critically, the two bulges on the outside of the foot represent spaces between bones. And if this had been just a gigantic human foot, or some kind of fake like that, these bulges and this bone spaces should have been set farther back. The fact of where they are indicates that this is a foot designed with different leverage, a longer heel, shorter forepart, which is exactly what would have to be done to make a foot that would lift an 800-pound animal. Homesteader Grover Kiggins and his daughter Millie saw evidence that Bigfoot has a stride to match the size of its feet. They were out near their farm in Oregon when they saw some tracks. We measured them. Dad had his rule. We measured him when we went up. He stepped 67 and a half inches, which is a long step. And then when he went down, he came down the road, and when he stopped at the edge of the road, he went off the road into the timber, down into the rough brush and timber. He stepped seven feet when he stepped down in there. And uh, 
I uh, followed him for a little ways down in there, but I decided I didn't want to go down in there and see what made those tracks. And in one place, he come to a fence, about a four-foot barbed wire fence, he just stepped over that like it wasn't there. I had to crawl through or under. <laughs> I think Bigfoot is an animal that we already know from the fossil record. I'll show you a specimen here. This is a cast of the lower jaw of a what we call the Gigantopithecus. This lived in China about half a million to a million years ago. I'd like to compare this with the gorilla. This is a cast of a gorilla's skull, so you can see the size of this thing. This was an animal that probably weighed about 400 pounds in the wild. And just looking at the lower jaw alone, what's perhaps most interesting is from the underside of the jaw, there is a difference. In the gorilla, the two sides of the jaw spread only modestly as you go back because the gorilla's neck is so far behind the lower jaw. If that neck were moved forward, the jaw would have to widen to make space. In the Gigantopithecus, the jaw is spreading at a much wider angle, and the only obvious reason for that is the neck is in the way, and that means the head was set on top of the body instead of hung forward, and it's a fair presumption that this was an erect bipedal animal. So we end up with the description of Gigantopithecus being a, uh, an erect biped, standing perhaps eight feet tall, weighing about 800 pounds, and being uh, presumably covered with hair. This was too early to have cultural activity, probably no more intelligent than an ape. And uh, this, of course, is an exact description of the living Sasquatch. Personally, I'd be less skeptical of ape men if there weren't so many of them. It's hard to believe that something like Bigfoot could remain undetected in America. If anyone gave me $100 to bet on it, well, I'd put 40 on the Yeti, 10 on Bigfoot, and I'd keep the 50 for myself. And there's more with Arthur C. Clarke.